uh, connections with China for a long time. And uh, they all have their books uh, writing about their observing or even their own life, all their experience in China. So today we are going to talk about China Sea from inside and outside. So first of all, let me introduce three uh, speakers today. Uh, on my right hand uh, is Leslie Chang, who has writing the the, who has a, uh, who's a writer of the Factory Girls. Um, this book has been translated into Chinese also, and I remember uh, it has quite a good uh, reflection feedback in uh, Chinese readers as well, because many people think it's the first time they uh, realize that someone can see from a very uh, unique perspective to the people who surrounding us, uh, surrounding them every day. They meet every day, but probably they never know about their lives. Um, and the second one is Miss Leonora uh, from America, right? Uh, who's the writer of The Little Soldiers. And also a very interesting book. You write, a, you wrote about your kids uh, studying in um, public kindergarten, a very famous one in Shanghai, and you start to observe the difference between uh, Chinese American education, etc. And uh, I, heard, I read news, uh, a lot of news about that book, and a lot of uh, feedbacks, and uh, invoke a lot of discussions in America. Actually, people are. Um, uh, to me, it seems like it's uh, no one uh, else has done this. Uh, to describe so details about the basic education in China. So we can discuss about that later, okay? And last one is Miss Zhang, Miss Zhang Li Jia. And uh, she's quite um, different from the, the, the other two here because uh, you were actually born in China and uh, for years. So Chinese is actually a native language, right? <laughs> yes, but uh, later you decide to write in English and uh, with very, uh, I would like to, you know, quite uh, inspiring and uh, breadth perspective of writing, introducing what your observations of China nowadays in English language, which obviously reach a lot of, lot of people overseas. So I'm quite interested in that uh, background, but uh, let's back to, uh, maybe we can start to talk a little bit. Uh, each of you, please just introduce a little background of your uh, connections with China, um, or your living experience in China before. So let's from, start from Masli, please. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Leslie. Um, so we were talking a little bit before about this yeah. theme of China from the inside and the outside, and no one really knows where this theme came from, but it's, <laughs> it's actually quite interesting because um, as a Chinese American growing up in America, but of Chinese parents, um, you, you always have this idea of China that's always present, but you don't really know how you fit into it. And um, I'm sure Lenora knows some of what I'm talking about. Um, so it often takes you a long time to figure out what China means to you, whether it means anything to you. Um, often as a young person, you just kind of want to reject this idea of China because that's your parents' generation and their story has nothing to do with you. Um, so I came to China as a journalist in 1999 and I worked for the Wall Street Journal. Um, and I kind of searched for a long time to figure out what is the story of China that I want to tell that I think is meaningful, that I think is important and that I can tell. Um, and it wasn't until I started reporting among the migrants in Dongguan, the young women who come from the very small villages to work in the factories, um, basically the complete opposite of who I am as an educated, you know, well-off American. Um, that was when I finally had this connection with China, was through meeting these young women. And it may sound strange, but even though their background is so different, I felt like we really related as, as human beings, as young women who are each searching for our way um, in China, in the world. Um, so that, that's one way that I see China sort of from the inside and the outside. I'm at, I'm at once, I can fit in and pretend that I'm one of them, but at the same time, I have an outsider's perspective and, and I think it's useful to kind of 
use that identity to your benefit as a writer. Um, you know, often when you're younger, you feel like it's a liability. I just want to be American. I want to fit in. I want to be like everyone else. But as you grow up, you realize that the things that make you different are often what make you interesting and maybe even more uh, able to see things. Um, so I'll just leave it there. Thanks. I think those are great points. You know, I grew up, um, like Leslie, I was born in the U.S. and raised by Chinese immigrant, um, Chinese immigrants to America. And then they put me through the process of going to college in the U.S. and graduate school. And then I announced that I'm moving to China in 2010. And my father, you know, you know, we fled that country <laughs> in the 40s. Uh, you know, you can't drink the tap water there. You know, he just didn't quite get it because he'd been so far removed. And so, you know, in 2010, I, I moved to Shanghai. Um, with my American husband, we're both journalists, and like Leslie said, it was definitely a search for identity in the beginning. I didn't know where I belonged. In fact, my Shanghainese cousin who did not leave, his family did not leave in the 40s, he said to me, neither country wants you, neither China nor America, you know, and, and uh, he was sort of joking, but it stung a little bit. Um, but really, it was this, um, when my son, when, when I began to interact with you know, China, you know, whatever that means. My son was in local school, and we put him in just a couple of years after uh, China took, you know, topped the charts on this international test called PISA. So the Western media sort of jumped on the story and said China is now an educational superpower because Shanghai teenagers are number one in the world in math, reading, and science. But my son's experience in this local kindergarten was very different, you know, he experienced incidents of shaming and all these things that as a mother um, you want to delve into a little bit further, uh, whether, you know, out of anxiety and then journalistically I wanted to unravel the story of conflict. You have people saying one thing about China, um, you have American media saying one thing, and then on the, the ground you experience something very different. So I sort of felt compelled to um, really unravel this, this story. And, and as Leslie said, I think being an outsider, but also having this heritage gave me an unusual perspective. Hi. Um, I guess uh, I'm quite different from my two colleagues who are sitting in the love seats. <laughs> I've just learned this term. This, is, this chair called love seats. <laughs> fitting to two people. Um, and I guess they are um, American-born Chinese, why I was born and grew up in Nanjing. Uh, in fact, I left China for the first time when I was 26 years old. Um, also, unlike them, I did not have a good education. When I was 16 years old, uh, I was taken out of school. So I worked at this uh, missile factory um, for 10 years, and I hated it. So as an escape route, I taught myself English. Uh, of course, this is a, it's a very difficult. I met uh, quite a few um, people like you, you know, and, and, and younger generation. It's not easier for young people to learn English. I mean, uh, well, I'm 54 years old. I mean, I, before, I, I, I started teaching myself English when I was 22. It was so difficult, and I had to borrow a radio from my cousin. And now there are so many courses on offer, so many devices. Um, looking back, I really, um, but it was quite difficult. And also, I, once I started, I became obsessed. Um, I would talk in English to myself and sing carpenter songs and sing, sing a song. People told me that learning English was a good way to learn the language. And uh, I earned myself a nickname that um, people, my colleagues, called me a toad who dreams to eat swan's meat. Basically, they were saying I was dreaming something impossible. Um, but now I, I'm glad I, I didn't give up because learning English uh, changed my life, brought my horizon. What I learned was just not ABC, but the whole, whole cultural package. But also it gave me... Um, my rice bowl, fan wan. Uh, I now make a living from writing. And you raised uh, a question why I would want to write in English. Um, even I was uh, working, um, I think at school I wanted to become writer and journalist, even though I didn't quite understand the difference between the two. 
And then I was, the dream was shattered. And, and when I was 16, I was taken out of school. Um, so, and, and then I wanted a while, I left China in 1990 to go to England. Once over there, a childhood dream stirred. I studied the journalism, I wanted to be a journalist, so I started journalism. And when I returned to China three years later, I began my career as a, as a fixer to journalist assistant. You, you must have quite a few of those before. And we set up interviews and did interpreting. And I loved the job. But I became frustrated because I didn't have the final say in case my view differed from the journalist I worked for. So I gave up. Um, I became a freelance journalist. I wanted to be a journalist of my own rights. And it was not an easy path, but I guess um, compared to my Western colleagues, I have something different to offer, which is the insight into the Chinese society. And I, really grew up, and even now I write English, and I, I think my sensibility is still Chinese. And just a final point, um, why I choose to write English. In, while I was living in Oxford, um, I was approached by a Chinese publishing company to write a book called a Western Image of Chairman Mao, which I found fascinating, very linked with uh, uh, the Western image of China. And I did a... Um, interviewed many people from all walks of life, and I spent many hours at the Bodinian Library, um, and, but the book didn't pass the censorship because it was regarded too negative, so the book never been published. So, you know, writing a book is such a, you know, you all know that um, writing a book is such a huge undertaking. And so ever since then, I decided I would write a books in English so I can be free and free from political you know, sensibility, censorship, but also in some ways freed from my inhibition. You know, English is not my native town, so I can be adventurous. That's uh, <laughs> probably more than enough from me. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, thank you. But then that leads to a question like, then you started to become a journalist, then you started, like uh, you have the books about uh, um, socialism is great. That one is actually based on your own experience, right? Yeah, that's um, not a book about socialism, <laughs> it's uh, about me. <laughs> is, that, is that the first uh, English book you put it, uh, the book you write in English language? Um, that before that, I co-authored a book with my ex-husband, a history book about China called China Remembers. But that's the book's first, first published solo book in English. Okay. About <laughs> okay. my experience of working at the missile factory. Okay. And it's about my life, but also yeah. it's set in, in, in China in the 80s. Mm. Um, and for many people of my generation, the 80s, it was just such a fascinating, most fascinating era in contemporary China. That's the time when China began to change, Deng Xiaoping introduced the reform, which really way transformed China beyond the economic fields, and very, very exciting time. So uh, hopefully you can learn China in a, in, uh, about China as well, through my personal story. Then last year you published a book about, uh, uh, named The Lotus. It's a it's a very nice book because you're writing a story about a girl who actually work with, in Chinese, we call sex worker, right? So uh, what, what brings, uh, what inspired you to, to write a novel like this? It's completely different with what you were doing before, right? Like something you were writing? Yeah, it's, uh, I always stress, because I've written a memoir, people often kind of expect I write another one, so I often say, <laughs> hold on, this is not another book about based on personal experience. <laughs> I've done a few things, uh, <laughs> only limited to intellectual prostitution. Yeah. <laughs> um, why I, I launched into uh, writing a fiction, somehow I felt I just want to stretch myself, and somehow, in some ways, I feel um, fiction perhaps is a, a final form of literature. I mean, perhaps I was wrong, but I want to try something different. I want to stretch myself. Um, I, the reason I wanted to write a book about prostitution was because my grandmother was a sex worker. I discovered this long-kept family secret back in 1998. 
in front of my grandma's deathbed, I learned that she was a sex worker, and I was shocked because my grandmother was a very special person. She brought me up. Um, I was really quite shaken. My, my grandmother, my mother then explained her story. My grandmother became orphan at the age of six, and then she was, uh, she was adopted by her aunt family. And when she blossomed into a beautiful young woman, she was sold into prostitution. And she met my grandfather on the job, and then who bought her out and installed her as a concubine. Um, in 1949, after the Chinese Communist Party took over, men were ordered to have one wife. So my grandfather stayed with my grand grandmother, his concubine. So for probably for that reason, my grandmother uh, was very grateful to the Communist Party, to Chairman Mao. And I, I, she was such an amazing woman, she suffered so much, but she was really always very grateful to life, and she thought how blessed she was. I wanted to write a book about her life, but I really didn't know enough. I tried to interview my mother. She really just didn't know very much. Um, so I, and then I became interested in prostitution. I started to notice that how sex industry became a huge, massive industry in China. Um, and then I, I went to a, a hair saloon, I wanted to get my hair cut in Shenzhen, and the girls there said that they didn't know. And then I, I looked down the floor, there was no hair shavings, and suddenly it clicked what kind of place that was. So I chatted with girls, they were all from the poor kind of hinterland of China, and um, they were all ear prepared, ear, you know, fully educated. So and I thought it was quite prostitution was quite an interesting window to explore the social tension because they touch us up on some really important aspect of our life, you know, migration, rural divide, a gender issue. Um, so that's that's how I launched this project <laughs> as a novel, as instead of a nonfiction. I see. Thank you. So actually, uh, you were. I think it's very interesting because Leslie's also, your factory book, you also uh, put your eyes on the two girls' experience about they working as in the, like, in a coffee, in a coffee factory, right? So they, you, how do you do that? You do the interview with them or you follow just to, like yearly interviews with them to try to find out, figure out how their lives and uh, like how many, years you've been doing the research yeah. after finish the book. Many, yeah. many, many years, it I feels like, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I, I initially had an idea to follow a large group of women, mm -hmm. um, maybe who were related to each other, uh -huh. and then just to kind of trace how their lives changed. Maybe some of them improved their lives, some of them stayed where they were, the conflicts. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that it was impossible because everyone was so individual and everyone was moving on their own path. Mm -hmm. People didn't move in groups. They often didn't even stay in touch with their good friends. Mm -hmm. um, so I finally just ended up following two women who I connected with and thought they were interesting and different. One was quite young. She was 18 when I first met her mm -hmm. and just starting out at a very low level uh, job inside a factory. Um, and the other woman was older, kind of um, early 30s, and I was interested in how women, older women, I mean, obviously not older, but older in the village context where by now she should have been married and had kids, mm -hmm. how she handled how to find a boyfriend, how to deal with her mm -hmm. parents, how to figure out what she wanted in the world. And so I would basically go down to Dongguan. I was living in Beijing at the time, and I would go down every month and spend a couple of weeks there um, just hanging around with them. Um, mm -hmm. and. It's really invaluable because, as you guys know, when you interview somebody, they don't necessarily tell you the things that are most interesting because they think it's so obvious or it doesn't occur to them. But when you're with them and you watch them dealing with their horrible bosses or their horrible boyfriends or you know, the people in their circle, you see all these things that tell you so much about how that world really works. So putting in that time, it's, mm -hmm. it's really intense, but it really pays off because you see so much that you wouldn't otherwise see. Yes, I, I noticed, noticed actually in the book you also, part of the one line is the story of the two girls, but the other line is about your family history in China, right? Um, why you make this decision to... to 
Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. So uh, actually, I was asking slide in in Leslie's book. There are actually two main lines. One line is a story about the two girls. Um, and the other lines about your family's history in mainland China. So, is it one of the way that uh, you try to put? Um, um, what? Okay, let me put it this way. So, to interview these two girls, to talk with two girls, will that remind? Is this because uh, it reminds some of? Uh, um, um, some of um, <laughs> my family experience. Yes, yeah. I mean, I mean, like, uh, would you ever think, like, if I, I my family didn't immigrate to America, probably these two girls' uh, fate could be my destiny as well, something um, like that. Yeah, I mean, it it ended up. Can you guys hear me? Is it okay? Um, so it's it started out kind of. Um, purely by accident. I was on a kind of a leave from the Wall Street Journal where I was working before to report this Factory Girls book. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a lot more free time, so I decided I would go and visit my grandfather's village in, mm -hmm. in Jilin province in northeastern China. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something I always meant to do, one of those Chinese-American things that you've been meaning to do and then do or don't do. Um, so I went there and I spent a weekend and I, I talked to some people and when I got home it suddenly occurred to me because my grandfather had left China as a young man, to, uh, left his village to go to Beijing for university and then he went abroad to America. Um, and he was of that generation, very idealistic, you know, 1920s, changing China, becoming modern, um, and changing into a modern person. Um, and I, I suddenly felt like there were commonalities between his experience and the experience of these young women, even though the background is so different. Um, I also felt like to write a story about China and have it only be in the present tense without a sense of history would be missing something because in China, even though it feels like everything's happening minute by minute, like I feel like the past is always there. You know, the past is is with people, even if they never talk about it. Um, the past inspires people to work so hard because they know what the alternatives were. Um, so that that kind of gave me a way to explore China's history at the same time I was telling this very modern story. Okay, thank you. So. Um, Leonola, when I was reading um, some articles you published in Wall Street Journal before, it's, uh, in, when I was reading some of articles you write uh, about what Wall Street Journal before, it's part of the chapters of The Little Soldier, and uh, I was quite enjoying reading the comments there. And uh, <laughs> it, it's quite interesting for me to see since that the reflections from uh, from the other side, from not, my, not from my perspective, but always inspiring. And uh, that reminds me also, I was reading Leslie's bio that uh, when she was young, she, even in, she, you're in American and you have to go to study Chinese every time you're forced by your parents. It's, maybe it's kind of Asian's, edu Asian's education culture that uh, but I, I'm curious about your own experience, like, have your parents ever put pressure uh, on you when you were a kid? <laughs> sure, so the Wall Street Journal essay that um, Wendy is referring to, um, the title that they chose was Why American Students Need Chinese Schools, and they had a picture <laughs> of me and my two boys on the front page of the Weekend Review section as if, you know, this American family needed, you know, some Chinese school to really get with it and work hard. And, you know, it was kind of interesting because I realized on a topic, education, it's a cultural activity. You know, that was really one of the biggest takeaways. I've been reporting this book for probably five years, and then I spent about two years writing it. And the characters are, one, my son in, local, um, in the local system in Shanghai, but also I ended up following these two high school students in Shanghai, and then I thought, well, we need to have, you know, I need to find out what's happening in, in rural areas because everybody kept telling me, I mean, the equality gap in China, inequality in China, um, you have to tell that story, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so I, a family in rural Anhui that I got to know over the years, I first met the mother, she's a migrant worker in Shanghai in 2012, and, um, 
I watched her son sort of go through the various testing milestones, like getting into high school, failing, what, do you, what does the family do then? What does the mother do to finance him through to the next level? So these stories I began to be quite captivated by. But um, the Western media, I think, I think it's very difficult to, I mean, there's so many stories and so many things going on in this book that they sort of center on this sort of parenting narrative. And you have to sort of pick a side. It, 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 I found that a lot of the media coverage of the book was either very positive on Chinese education or very negative on Chinese education, and it was quite interesting. Uh, the South China Morning Post took more of a negative view. They said, the draconian education system that shames children and locks you know, kids in rooms and that sort of thing. But you know, the truth is really much more nuanced, and, and it takes time to sort of unravel. I, I can't remember what the question was, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just your, well, oh, you're pushing to start away. Yeah, very working. briefly. <laughs> you know, so I, I did really was fascinated with this idea of authority, relationship to authority. My son, at the age of three, became terrified of his teacher. Um, and, you know, th that's sometimes useful, you know, and sometimes it's not useful. But uh, what does authority mean in, in your life? What, is, what did it mean in my life? What does it mean in my son's life? Generally, in education culture in China, you respect your teacher. And I found studies that even showed this relationship. It's not a feeling, it's actually there, it, in fact, right? In as far as, you know, what the government intends to do with teacher pay in China. Um, how many Chinese encourage their kids to become teachers? It's more than 50%. In America, it's something like 25%. You know, these are all measures of respect. And, um, I realized that that was what my father was hoping to duplicate as he was raising me w with less success because I'm too much of a rebel, I think. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm now uh, to give the floors to open question session to all our audience. Um, would you like to? Yes, please. Hello. Somebody have to break their eyes. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Pontu Finau in the name of uh, the director and founder uh, who is here present. I'm sure that he's very proud to have started this seven years ago. I'm very fond of him because he's totally unbiased in his uh, uh, journalism and as a journalist, I think it's very difficult to function in Macau. So for, uh, for what he has contributed to Macau and the one country, two system, I think we have to congratulate uh, Ricardo Pinto for what he's done. So I think that, that it deserves more than just this uh, once a year function. So I'd like everybody to congratulate him for what he's done. This is the first time I've been to this uh, 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 festival, and I think that this should be promoted even much widely. And whatever the quality of the speaker is beyond my expectations. I'd like to ask the lady who spoke about her grandparents being a sex worker, how she feels about it, and also, uh, the lady that talks about how she experienced her, her um, a life in America and all that. But first of all, I'd like to ask, uh, as, a, as a granddaughter mm -hmm, of somebody mm -hmm. that have experienced or have a, a know about the, the, that experience mm -hmm. and so bravely expose that to the public uh, of Macau, which is still fairly conservative. How do you feel about uh, your f the people's reaction on that? Because it will certainly be reported, if not registered, mm -hmm. in the media. Um, 
Well, my grandmother sadly passed away um, in 1998 when she was uh, 83 years old. And um, I think my, I'm very proud of my, I'm very proud of my grandmother who was an amazing woman. And I just, as I grew older, and I appreciate her quality even more. And I think she, you know, she suffered so much and she, she suffered, you know, as often. And then she, you know, endured humiliation as a sex worker. And then she suffered as a concubine because concubine's position was quite lower than a proper wife. And, you know, she suffered the rape of Nanjing and she once told me how they, were, they had to run away. Some there were bombs falling on them, and somebody just explosion, and then just the person just went, just died. And, and she suffered so much, but she always felt she was a very, very lucky person. And I, I as after I grew up, I lived in the West, and I, f I met many very people, very lived a very privileged life, and they complained so much. And my grandmother suffered so much, and she, she always felt she was such a lucky person. Um, and I think that she belonged to the older generation um, um, of, of the Chinese people who had this extraordinary ability to take suffering without bitterness. And also, I want to give uh, people like her, and I, in, in recent years, to write this book, and I spent lots of time with sex workers, and I become, some of them very generously, very kindly shared uh, their stories with me. And no character in this book is based on one real life uh, person, but uh, some the small details are real. So I think in some ways, I just want to return the humanity to this group of women who don't have a voice. And they, they are really just, they're just humans. And many women, uh, you know, I met, they, they pick up, they were driven to the flesh trade because they have very little other choices. And Chen Xiaoping's reforms and opening up brought a huge opportunities to both men and women and the urban educated people particularly but also brought um, gender inequality, unfortunately, has expanded. That drove some most vulnerable women to take up the flash trade. So um, anyway, so that's, that's my, in some ways, that's my mission. So inspired by my grandmother. And I want to give this, um, give them, you know, return the humanity to them. And I hope my grandmother will be part of me. My one is to Leslie. I was wondering, do you still keep in touch with the girl that you met in the factory? And uh, did you introduce your book to them? And if yes, how do they react? Yeah, I, um, I do keep in touch with both of the women I, I write about. And I just talked to them recently over the last uh, week or so by phone. They're both doing really well. Um, and WeChat. On WeChat, yes. <laughs> They're more modern than I am because I just got on WeChat, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, they're going through lots of ups and downs. Um, they both uh, have children and they're both kind of going on with their lives, but still, you know, they're, they're a good window for me to see what people are going through in terms of, um, I, I think China is entering a phase now where kind of the, generally the material stability is there, the material comfort is generally there. But there's still a lot of change, a lot of, I think, more social and emotional and psychological stresses um, as people are figuring out things such as Lenora wrote about, how to educate your child, how to give your family the best opportunity, maybe how to stop working so hard and give yourself a, a way to be more happy and more relaxed. Um, so people are still weighing all these different issues and, and through them I can really see um, a lot of what people are going through. Can I just edit once a few things about Leslie's book? And I think the factory workers is probably one of the best, the very best uh, non-fiction book China, uh, not non-fiction books, books coming from China. 
And I'm myself writing my next book, which is a book about uh, uh, left behind children and focusing one village. When I was in the village the first time, I, um, I brought her book with me and I read it very, studied it very carefully and it would just remind me again how, how much effort she put into it. And um, I just think it's really amazing, just so, so much details, vivid detail, and that doesn't just uh, coming from a few hours interview with anybody, just uh, many, many hours and weeks and months of effort. So I applaud <laughs> Leslie's great achievement. Um, I, because I wrote a book, because I was a factory worker, and she wrote a book called The Factory Girls, people often confused, <laughs> confused me with her. I'm often very flattered. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. I haven't read um, uh, Nolora's book. I'm, I just bought it. I'm sure it's great as well. <laughs> yeah, no, one thing I wanted to add to that is um, it's funny how many people who know China, they'll read my book and say, oh, my God, that was, I could tell how much work, you know. So it's sort of like, as, as many of you know, reporting and working in China is, it's incredibly, it takes so much energy to get stuff. But at the end of the day, hopefully it's really rewarding. But it's, it's nice to be among people who appreciate that and recognize that. Yeah, oh, that was your other question. Yes, the book has been published in Chinese. It came out several years ago. Um, and you can buy it right here. <laughs> <laughs> but they sold out of the English one, unfortunately. Um, so when the book came out, I did show the two women I wrote about um, the book. And um, one of them, Chunming, was very happy about it. And she's the one who I wrote lots of really personal things about her dating and her you know, fights with men and her various complications. And she was totally fine with that because she's such an open-minded person. Um, and the younger woman I wrote about, Min, she actually had a very small objection. It's, it's one of those things where when you write about someone, you never know what, how they're going to respond. Um, so she actually was fine with 99% of the book, but there was one scene where I talked about her older sister going home to her village for Chinese New Year, and her older sister had brought a boyfriend who was from another province, and her mom was really upset because this boyfriend was not from their home province. And so Min said to me, my sister's going through a lot of problems with her now husband who's different from this boyfriend, and the fact that you wrote about this boyfriend is adding to their marital difficulties, and they're really upset about it, you know? And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that this is the thing that she would object to. So for the Chinese version, I changed her name so that there wouldn't be an identification with her. But overall, I think that... China has changed so much that when they look at these stories about their lives, it's almost like a historical document of something that happened way in the past. So I think they kind of like to have that record. Thanks. Next question. <laughs> Hello. Um, being Portuguese and living in Macau, I really would like to know when you lived in China, did you feel American in China? Both of you sitting in the, on the love, love, love chair. And the, sec and the second part is when you went back to America, did you somehow felt a little bit more Chinese then? Ah, interesting. You know, I still live in Shanghai. Um, I've been there since 2010 and I feel, okay, my son, actually I'm, I'm more curious about my son because he's, you know, for a long time was really the only foreigner in his Chinese school. And his teacher would actually call him little Lao Wai, which means little foreigner. Little Lao Wai, little Lao Wai, come over here. And he just didn't blink an eye. It was just normal to him. So oftentimes when you're in China and you look like my son, he's actually half Caucasian, Yes, you feel American because they remind you every day. <laughs> um, but I don't. I mean, I, I feel like sort of in between. And I, and I, yes, perhaps when I'm in China, I feel more American. When I'm in America, I often rush into the elevator. I have to sort of recorrect my physical behaviors. You know, just, just <laughs> you're afraid you're not going to get a spot. You know, and I did that in New York City. And even New York City, this very rushing, vibrant metropolis, everyone's sort of staring at me. I'm like, oh, I forgot. I'm sorry. I'm constantly apologizing for myself. Um, 
Yeah, but this issue of identity, you know, it's more fluid today than it is in, you know, in the past. When I was growing up Chinese in America in this, you know, suburban school in Houston, Texas, was constantly, you know, I, I, my, my friends would come over and I had chopsticks at the table. There's a pile of shoes at the door. Most American households don't have these indications of being Chinese. And I sometimes look at my son, I wonder if I'm confusing him, but actually his identity is quite fluid and identities in general are more fluid, borders are more fluid, and, and so I think that it's not going to be a concern. Can I um, add something? It's related but quite different. You know, I told you how learning English changed my life. And I, I realized it was quite a different how when I speak English and uh, I think of my personality changes slightly. And for example, I, when I speak Chinese, I realize I speak much louder, faster. And when I speak English, I try to be more sophisticated. <laughs> I remember I went to a restaurant with a Western male friend and I, I was asking, Wait! Or in a you know, restaurant, you in Chinese restaurant, you shout at them. You know, waiter, hey, where's my food? Hurry up. You know, I was shouted in Chinese. <laughs> I was just saying, I said, oh, you speak Chinese very different. <laughs> you sound very different in Chinese. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I think that we all have this kind of disconnect when we go back and forth. Um, I think I feel myself very American, actually. Um, other than my food preferences, which I think are very Chinese, I think that's the last thing to change. But other than that, I do feel that, although I look Chinese on the outside, my upbringing, uh, my mindset, like yours, is it's so different. It's really, really different. And you can live there for a really long time and have really close friendships and have really meaningful experiences, but I, I always still feel like I'm, I don't belong to that society. I belong to this other society, even if I haven't lived there. Well, I'm living there now, but even when I'm away for 10 years, I belong completely to that society. Um, but another thing I wanted to mention was I, we, my husband and I lived, uh, we're both writers, and we lived in Egypt for five years. And having had that experience, you really see China so differently. Um, much more so, I think, than when you're in America, because America is kind of its own thing, and China is its own thing, and it, you're, you're not gonna apply the American standards to China necessarily. But when you're living in Egypt, which is another developing world country with a very large population, a very illustrious history, but a lot of current problems, you can make more of a direct comparison. And, you know, Egypt definitely suffers <laughs> in the comparison because, you know, suddenly you realize, wow, economic policy is important, infrastructure is important, good education is important, and sometimes when you spend a lot of time in China, you take these things for granted. You think that every, every government basically is doing these things, because that's what you see in America, that's what you see in, when you're in Europe, that's what you see in China. But being in Egypt is a reminder how hard it is to get all those pieces in place. Um, and what happens when you don't get those pieces in place, and what you see are incredible women, I've met incredible women in Egypt just as I met incredible women in China, but in Egypt it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't become part of a larger movement, it does be, doesn't become an economic and social revolution that's giving women more opportunity and getting them out of their villages and changing the dynamics of family. What happens is you have a strong woman and maybe she's working, but at the end of the day she goes home to her husband, she still has to get his slippers, she still has to cook his dinner, and she still has to be criticized about how she's not being a good wife because she's working. Um, so it's, it's a real reminder that without those invisible systems in place, um, you know, really talented people still can't go anywhere. Okay, I think we only have an uh, opportunity for the last uh, question. So, is anyone? Hi, Leslie. My question is for you. We had a chance to listen to your husband, who was also a guest of the festival, um, speaking about um, the changes in China, uh, because of course you lived there uh, some years ago. And I'd like to, to have your perspective on that now that you are also considering to rebase uh, in China as a family. So how do you perceive China at this precise moment with all the changes that are happening? Thank you. 
Um, yeah, I'll let you know when we move back. I mean, we were just there for about two weeks just checking out where we're going to live and where our kids are going to go to school. Um, you know, uh, one of the reasons we want to move back is because we've been away about 10 years and so many things have happened there, of course. Um, and as we were talking about, I feel like China's reached a certain level of material stability, but I think it's going through another really interesting phase where now it's more the emotional and the, and the psychological and the personal searching, um, which I think is still going very strong. Um, it's probably a more subtle story, but I think it's still, it's still profound, um, the changes and challenges that people are going through. Um, and we're also hoping to live in Sichuan province, um, where my husband taught in the Peace Corps, and just to get a really different perspective, um, to get away from the big cities and, and all the foreigners, and just kind of see how things work in a big city, but that's a little bit more anonymous and not as centrally located. But um, I can't answer your question right now because it's only been a couple of weeks, but we'll, we're looking forward to seeing what's changed and what hasn't um, as we go back. And we're looking forward to more articles coming soon <laughs> for everyone here, actually. So actually, today's topic is China seen from inside and outside. For me, it's also quite interesting topic because I live in Macau, but I also live in mainland China. So I split my day also inside and outside. Well, here, right, well, you know, the China we mainly means mainland China, right? So it's different jurisdictions, different uh, government and so many things different. But as uh, the old saying says, 100 readers, they will read 100 different hamlets. So uh, whatever you books will bring us is your, not only your own experience, your own observation about China, but it will well, for sure inspire most of us who live here as a, uh, as a kind of foreigner and uh, have some uh, invoking some emotion, emotionally memories. And I think that's the most precious part of being with the literary, being with the creative writing and being here talking with you, always the very beautiful three books. And thanks again for joining us for this session. And we're looking forward to seeing you soon or reading more articles soon. Thanks. Thanks everyone here today.